Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of today is yet another important disease which comes in the category of autoimmune collagen vascular disorders. And this is systemic sclerosis. Systemic sclerosis is a multi-system autoimmune disease that causes fibrosis of the skin and internal organs with associated vascular and inflammatory manifestations, including Raynaud's phenomena. Uh, so the main thing here is the presence of fibrosis of the skin and internal organs with associated vascular and inflammatory manifestation, among which Raynaud's stands uh, very important in the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. The disease has high mortality due to cardiac, pulmonary, and renal complications and substantial morbidity from pain, digital ulceration, calcinosis, telangiectasis, and GI and musculoskeletal involvement. So this disease carry a very high burden of both um, mortality as well as morbidity. Synonyms and inclusions. Scleroderma is best kept as an umbrella term for the group of conditions that include both localized form and systemic form. The two major subsets of systemic sclerosis are the limited systemic sclerosis abbreviated as LSSC and diffuse systemic sclerosis abbreviated as DSSC. The acronym CREST or calcinosis, R for Raynaud's phenomena, E for esophageal dysfunction, S for sclerodactyly and T for telangiectasis refers to a group of cases of limited systemic sclerosis. A rare group of systemic sclerosis cases do not have cutaneous features of skin thickening and are termed as S SC sign scleroderma. I will explain about this group. Uh, there was a previous diagnostic criteria. This criteria lacked the sensitivity and specificity, but this criteria was easy to use. And this previous diagnostic criteria included one major and three minor criteria. The major criteria was proximal scleroderma. That is scleroderma distal to the metacarpophalangeal joint, proximal to metacarpophalangeal joints. So the proximal scleroderma was the major criteria. The minor criteria were uh, sclerodactyly, that is sclerosis of the fingers, digital pitted scars or loss of subcutaneous substance from the finger pads, and by basilar pulmonary fibrosis. That is both the lungs be involved. And it was said that one major and two or more of the minor criteria are required to diagnose a patient as systemic sclerosis. But now the classification criteria for systemic sclerosis is a little complicated one, but this criteria has high degree of uh, sensitivity as well as specificity. So the criteria number one, which carries the highest score of nine, include skin thickening of the fingers of both hands, extending proximal to metacarpophalangeal joint. This was the major criteria uh, of the uh, major criteria of the previous. Uh, diagnosis, diagnostic criteria for systemic sclerosis. So this still holds important in the new criteria. That is uh, thickening of the skin of both fing fingers of both hands proximal to metacarpophalangeal joint. The other criteria uh, include skin thickening of the fingers, that is sclerodactyly. This has uh, two subsets. Uh, the puffy fingers only, it carries two marks, and thickening of the fingers distal to metacarpophalangeal joint carries four marks. Uh, 
finger tip lesions. Uh, digital tip ulcers carry two marks and pitted scarring carries three marks. Then teringectasias on the face carries two marks. Abnormal nail fold capillaries carry two marks. Raynaud's phenomena carry three marks. And the only systemic criteria in this uh, includes pulmonary arterial hypertension or interstitial lung disease, which carries two marks. And the last of the criteria include the autoimmune antibodies, which include the anti-centromere uh, or anti-topoisomerase 1, which is SCL70, or anti-RNA polymerase 3. Any of the three antibodies carries three marks. If the total score of each category is added up and the patient carries nine or more score, then the patient will be classified as uh, a patient of systemic sclerosis. So if only the finding is the um, sclerosis or thickening of skin proximal to metacarpophalangeal joint, then this criteria itself carries uh, nine marks. And this is uh, by itself sufficient to diagnose a patient as systemic sclerosis. Distinguishing features of the new criteria. The criteria provides a point score based on specific clinical and immunological features. The updated criteria is more sensitive, especially in patients with either early or limited systemic cirrhosis when the proximal, when the uh, thickening of skin proximal to metacarpophalangeal joint is not very obvious, but other, if the other criteria are fulfilled, then even then, the patient can be labeled as systemic sclerosis, which was not seen in the old criteria. This criteria take accounts of bit better disease assessment, including SEC specific autoantibodies or nail fold caploscopic patterns. Uh, differences between the limited and diffuse uh, systemic sclerosis. In limited systemic sclerosis, anti-centromere antibodies are positive in 50% of the cases, while in uh, systemic sclerosis, anti-RNA polymerase is seen in 25% and topoisomerase antibody, which is SCL70, is present in 30% of the cases. Then, uh, as far as the sclerosis is concerned, the limited one involves extremities and face, while in diffuse variety, uh, there is diffuse involvement proximal or to the proximal limb, trunk, and face. In limited, there is a long history of pre-existent Raynaud's disease, but in diffuse, there is a short history of Raynaud's phenomena. Limited has slower onset and progression. Diffuse has rapid onset and progression. Peak skin uh, sclerosis score is less than 14 in limited and more than 14 in diffuse variety. There is isolated uh, primary pulmonary hypertension uh, and lung fibrosis half as common, uh, lung fibrosis and half as common as gastroesophageal reflux. However, lung fibrosis, secondary pulmonary hypertension uh, is much common in diffuse cutaneous variety. Low risk of renal crisis of cardiac disease, and there is high risk of organ-based complications in uh, diffuse systemic sclerosis, such as renal crisis. Then digital ulcers or calcinosis are seen, digital ulcer and calcinosis is seen in diffuse variety. Digital ulcers are, sorry, limited variety. Digital ulcers are seen in diffuse variety, but calcinosis is relatively rare. This table also shows the differences between the limited and diffuse scleroderma, as far well as the anti-nuclear pattern, the increased syndrome or limited scleroderma, anti-centromere antibodies are more prominent. That is more than 50% of the cases are positive. While the speckle type of antibodies are common in diffuse scleroderma. Anti-SCL70, which is anti-topoisomerase antibody is positive in 30 percent or more cases of diffuse scleroderma. Pulmonary involvement 
more commonly associated with pulmonary hypertension. However, a diffuse type more commonly associated with alveolitis and inflammatory lung disease. Then renal involvement is uh, usually not seen in case of limited systemic sclerosis, while it is uh, quite common in uh, diffuse variety, which is associated with a scleroderma renal crisis called as SRC, which is typically potentiated by glucocorticoid use. There are two types of antinuclear antibodies, centromere antibodies seen in limited and speckle type antibodies seen in diffuse variety. If we compare the uh, antibodies uh, among the two groups, the antinuclear antibodies are seen in 70 to 90% of cases of diffuse as well as limited systemic sclerosis. NTSCL 70 is seen in 30% of cases of diffuse and 10% cases of limited systemic sclerosis. Anti-centromere antibodies are seen in 50 to 90% of limited and only 5% of diffuse systemic sclerosis. And anti-RNP70 is seen in 10% of systemic, limited systemic and 15% of diffuse systemic sclerosis. In addition, anti-RNA polymerase 3 antibodies called as ARA or ARA or RNAP, rapidly progressive diffuse systemic sclerosis uh, seen in 25% of the cases. Anti-U1 RNP uh, is seen in 15% of systemic sclerosis and in S systemic sclerosis SLE overlap, anti-U1 RNP is seen in 44% of the cases. So anti-U1 RNP is important in overlap syndromes. Introduction and general description. The systemic sclerosis is rare but important because it has the highest case specific mortality of any autoimmune rheumatic disease. Skin manifestations include thickening or fibrosis, mostly over the extremities and face in limited form and much more extensive in diffuse form. The associated features include severe pruritus, digital ulceration, vascular abnormalities that include telangiectasias, calcinosis, diffuse hyper hyperpigmentation, and salt and pepper dispigmentation. Systemic sclerosis is a multi-system disease. Thus, the main focus of investigation and treatment need to be on the manifestations beyond the skin. Typically, a patient present with Raynaud's phenomena and symptoms of GI reflux. This is followed by a phase of non-pitting digital edema, after which skin thickens and sclerodectly develops. The third feature is the inflammatory musculoskeletal system, affairs, uh, signs and symptoms, and severe internal organ involvement such as cardiac, lung, or renal complications. The systemic investigation and treatment of these complications is important for all new cases of systemic sclerosis and is the cornerstone of the medical management. So to summarize this slide, the first presentation in most of the patient is by Raynaud's phenomena and GI reflux. After this uh, manifestation, then sclerodectly sets in. And after the sclerodectly and thickening of the rest of the skin, the complication phase occur in which the main brunt is taken by the heart, kidneys, and lungs. Epidemiology. In Europe and North America, 7.2 to 33.9 cases per 100,000 is the um, uh, incidence with an annual incidence of uh, 0.6 to 2.3 cases per 100,000. No apparent racial predominance. Overall, substantial female predominance exists with male to female ratio between three to six, ratio one. Systemic sclerosis usually appear in women aged 30 to 40 years and it occurs 
in slightly older men. Approximately 85% of the cases of systemic sclerosis develop in individuals between 20 to 60 years of ages. Associated diseases. The commonest of the associated diseases was Jogren syndrome, autoimmune thyroiditis, which are identified as 12% and 6% in patient of systemic sclerosis. The frequency of myositis, primary biliary cirrhosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and SLE were lower than 4%. Interestingly, 36% of the patients of systemic sclerosis has a first degree relative with at least one autoimmune disease of which the most frequent is rheumatoid arthritis and less frequent is autoimmune thyroiditis or thyroid disease. Overlap connective tissue disorders. Systemic sclerosis can occur as a component of an overlap connective tissue disorders such as mixed connective tissue disease. Such patient, ex such patient exhibit at least two connective tissue diseases concomitantly. The commonest SCC overlap is with myositis, which is 42.8% of the cases, followed by rheumatoid arthritis, that is 32%, Jogren syndrome, 16.8%, and SLE, 8.4%. The overlaps. The proportion of overlap with limited and diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis is 71.7% with limited and 27% with diffuse systemic sclerosis. Patients with myositis overlap, however, are more likely to have diffuse disease rather than limited disease. In rest, other overlaps, the more common disease is the limited disease. And those patients with myositis and diffuse systemic sclerosis overlap exhibit anti-polypolymyositis anti and scleroderma antibodies, which are anti-PMSCL uh, in 33%, anti-JO1 in 6%, and anti-KU in 2%. The main antibody uh, between in myositis systemic sclerosis overlap is uh, polymyositis scleroderma, PMSCL antibody. Anti-centromere antibodies are seen Uh, in 45% and anti-RO antibody 30% in patient with, uh, S, uh, with uh, systemic sclerosis and Jogren syndrome overlap. Anti-U1 RNP was uh, frequently seen in SLE and systemic sclerosis overlap. Anti-situlated peptide antibodies, anti-CCP, was frequent in patient with systemic sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis overlap. So in different overlap syndromes, there are different antibodies which are more prevalent. It is suggested that systemic sclerosis overlap patients should be considered a third subset of disease and appear to run a slightly different course. The first is limited, second is diffuse subset. So the third subset is those SCC patients which are having an overlap syndrome. Malignancy and systemic sclerosis. Malignancies are reported to be between 3.6 to 10.7% in patients diagnosed with systemic sclerosis. There is an increased risk of lung cancer, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and hematopoietic cancers. While increased risk of bladder and liver cancer was found in only one analysis. There are published association between esophageal, oropharyngeal, and more non-melanoma skin cancers. Men with systemic sclerosis seems to be a greater risk of developing cancer as compared to women. Predisposing factors. It is likely that the disease occur as a consequence of a triggering event. Gender, ethnicity, and environmental aspects may increase the susceptibility. There is a strong HLA association, particularly, particularly DRB1 and DQB1, and some altered immune inflammatory genes. Pathogenesis. Two main histological features are seen in the disease, they, which are endothelial cell damage and its sequels, and abnormalities of collagen and its synthesis. So vessel damage and abnormalities in collagen synthesis. 
some cytotoxic substance, probably proteases or immunoreactants, IgG or complement may damage the endothelial cells. The damaged endothelial cells get leaky, resulting in dermal edema in early lesions. The endothelial damage is monitored clinically by increased von Willebrand factor and reduced ACE level and demonstrated by nail fold examination. So endothelial damage can be assessed very early by a von Willebrand factor test, ACE level in investigation and nail fold examination. Most of the inflammatory cells in systemic sclerosis are CD4 positive T cells. These cells secrete interleukin 17 that activate and induce proliferation of fibroblasts. Under its influence, fibroblasts secrete interleukin 6 and 8, which induce the proliferation of fibroblasts and induce collagen synthesis. So, first, the endothelial damage, then, leaking of CD4 positive T cells release of interleukin-17, and interleukin-17 proliferates fibroblasts, and fibroblasts secrete interleukin-6 and 8, which in turn causes more fibroblastic proliferation and collagen synthesis. Duplication of fibrillin-1 gene causes tight skin and detected by high level of anti-fibrillin-1 antibodies. Increased collagen synthesis and scarring is demonstrated by increased proline hydroxylase activity can be tested, increased uptake of labeled proline, increased serum concentration of N-terminal peptide of type 3 collagen, this is also, can also be tested, and increased urinary excretion of hydroxyproline, this can also be tested. So all these tests will show that the collagen synthesis is increased. Culture of fibroblasts from patient of systemic sclerosis synthesize more collagen and there is reduced collagenase activity. So more is formed and less is disintegrated. Fibrosis is due to the deposition of type one, two, four, uh, five and six collagen accompanied by excessive amount of fibronectin. So this is a table which shows this process, the endothelial damage, the release of T cells, then uh, release, re release of interleukins causing, uh, causing yeah. fibroblastic proliferation and collagen synthesis. This is how the histopathology of skin will look like. The histopathological appearance of systemic sclerosis is not different from morphia, and it shows um, either atrophic epidermis or unremarkable epidermis and very thick and dense dermis with thick and dense collagen bundles and absence or reduced number of adenexal structures. The third coils which are seen to be present at uh, the junction of dermis and subcutaneous fat are seen trapped within the dermis in systemic sclerosis and morphia. These are the complex acrine glands. Vascular involvement is characterized by intimal fibrosis, obliteration of lumen, and surrounding chronic inflammation and scarring. A key pathological feature of systemic sclerosis that crosses multiple organ beds is proliferative vasculopathy with new intimal hyperplasia and luminal node narrowing, meaning obliteration of the vessel wall lumen in many different organs. This is often associated with adventitial fibrosis and notably in kidneys and in intrarenal arterial circulation and in pulmonary arterial tree is accompanied by thickening or hypertrophy of smooth muscle medial layer of the medium size blood vessels. So the vasculopathy or damage in vessels is a key factor in the pathogenesis of systemic sclerosis. The extent to which the compromised tissue perfusion and leads to other complications is unclear. 
but it is likely to be ex, uh, especially relevant to the development of digital ischemia. So the uh, causes of digital ischemia, uh, small ulcers, bitter scarring is mainly because of the, uh, of the luminal narrowing of the digital blood vessels. There is a spectrum of severity in terms of vascular damage and proliferative changes and amount of fibrosis also varies between different categories of patients. Interestingly, severity of acute vascular injury and, uh, and the change appear to correlate with poor long-term outcome and less renal recovery, where the, whereas the extent of scarring or fibrosis, unlike in many uh, chronic renal disease, seems less important. So among the two salient pathological features, the endothelial injury is more important in causing the systemic complications than the fibrotic complications. Causative organisms. Are there any causative organisms? Some studies have implicated viruses, such as cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus and parvovirus B19 in triggering the disease. In most cases of systemic sclerosis, infection is more relevant because of the risk of opportunistic infections since such patients are immunosuppressed and have increased susceptibility to infection because of digital ulcers, fibrotic lungs, reduced respiratory reserve, and interstitial disease. Genetics. High risk, uh, highest risk factor for developing systemic sclerosis is having a sibling or first degree relative with a disease, which increase the chances of systemic sclerosis by 13 to 15 fold. A genetic predisposition to vasculopathy, Raynaud's, autoimmune inflammatory diseases like SLE or thyroid, or interstitial lung disease has been found in SSC pedigrees. The work has confirmed the major role of HLA region in systemic sclerosis, and variants have already told include DPB1, DQA1, DOA with, with ACA positive, HLA DRB1, non HLA gene TAP2, peptide loading on major histocompatibility class 2 molecules. Environmental factors. This may include infectious agents as discussed above or factors such as vaccination that may trigger the immune alteration. Silica is important and probably explains the association of systemic sclerosis with mining in USA and South Africa. In addition, organic solvents like vinyl chloride are well recognized to lead to systemic sclerosis like disease. Occupational exposure, particularly high cumulative exposure to crystalline silica, white spirit, aromatic solvents, chlorinated solvents, trichlor, trichloroethylene, ketones, and welding fumes are associated with increased risk of systemic sclerosis. There is no association between systemic sclerosis and use of drugs such as anorexigenes, pentazocine, pentazocine, bromocryptine, L-tryptophan, or hair dyes. There is no association between the presence of silicon breast implant and systemic sclerosis. Smoking does not increase the risk of developing systemic sclerosis, but does appear to impact upon the severity of the disease, particularly in relation to the vasculopathy. Clinical features. History. The majority of cases have onset in adult age, 20 to 60 years, and many patients describe Raynaud's as the first symptom. Patients describe change in color of the finger or toes triggered by exposure to cold or environmental stress, both in winter and in summer. Occasionally, ear and nose can be affected. Both classic 
triphasic Reynolds phenomena, white, blue, and then red. And in some cases, biphasic color changes occur in systemic sclerosis. Any change of new onset Reynolds phenomena occurring over the age of 40 is more likely to be associated with underlying connective tissue disease. Reynolds phenomena in systemic sclerosis is more likely to be associated with complications such as pitted digital scars, digital ulcers, peronychia, or trophic changes in finger pulps. At its most severe, critical digital ischemia can lead to gangrene and autoamputation. Another key early symptom is gastroesophageal reflux or dysphagia, which is often treated with proton pump inhibitors. Swelling and stiffness of digits is, uh, the, is the third reported symptom uh, in early stages of S systemic sclerosis. H is hallmark of diffuse skin involvement and can be confined to skin of forearms or may be generalized. Skin tightening or thickening depends upon the subset and severity of systemic sclerosis. The constitutional symptoms that include fatigue and weight loss are common in systemic sclerosis, especially in early diffuse disease. Most common cause of weight loss is malnutrition due to reduced appetite, physical difficulty with eating due to Sika syndrome, and dysphagia. Finally, any of the major internal organ complication of systemic sclerosis may occasionally be the presenting feature such as pulmonary arterial hypertension, lung fibrosis, or uh, severe renal disease. The typical presenting feature of S uh, systemic sclerosis and Raynaud's uh, symptoms of GI reflux with swelling and discomfort of the extremities. This is followed by specific skin manifestations such as puffiness, tightness, and hardening and itching. Telangiectasia and calcinosis tend to occur later in the disease, as do the features of internal organs. Now, uh, something about the Raynaud phenomena. Since this is the most common symptom, it has to be discussed in detail. And some cases of uh, systemic sclerosis present as isolated Raynaud's phenomena. Tests such as anti autoantibody profile and nail fold capromicroscopy, uh, caproscopic examination are helpful in identifying such cases. The presence of positive anti-nuclear antibody, previous or current puffy fingers, and Raynaud's phenomena should raise the suspicion of very early systemic sclerosis. Cases of systemic sclerosis with long existing history of Raynaud's phenomena tend to evolve into limited systemic sclerosis and that cases of diffuse, uh, and that the cases of diffuse skin disease may occur without a long pre-existing history of Raynaud's phenomena. So a long history favors uh, the um, uh, limited variety and a short history favors the diffuse variety of systemic sclerosis. This is the Raynaud's phenomena. That is, uh, in few of the fingers, this um, pallor. Arteriogram shows narrowing or occlusion of the digital artery. You cannot see the arteries beyond uh, this uh, distal phalanx, well, sorry, proximal phalanx. Proximal vessels, arcades, and metacarpal vessels are widely patent here. Cutaneous manifestations. There are three stages in progression of disease seen on hands and feet. The earliest is non-pitting edema and puffiness, which is seen mainly on the face and hands. After the non-pitting edema, the skin becomes taut and indurated, thickened, and fixed to the deeper structures on fingers resulting in sclerodactyly. The skin sclerosis leads to progressive loss of skin appendages, reduce hair growth, reduce sweating, and joint contractures. <laughs> 
लास्ट स्टेज इज द स्टेज ऑफ एट्रोफी विद लॉस ऑफ फिंगर पल्प अल्सरेशन एंड कैल्सिफिकेशन सो फर्स्ट स्टेज इज एडीमा सेकेंड स्टेज इज इन ड्यूरेशन एंड थर्ड स्टेज इज एट्रोफी मास्क लाइक फेसिस डिवेलप as the facial skin become waxy and wrinkles appear diminished nasal becomes beaked radial furrowing appear around the oral mucosa uh, oral mucosa around the lips reduced oral aperture and mat like telangiectasia develop on the face this is the edematous phase of the hands and fingers then the induration now the tightening sets in and this is the stage of acrosclerosis where the skin gets atrophic and with digital terminal absorption loss of the finger pulps nails are overriding the distal phalanx you can see the acrolysis the even the bone of the distal phalanx is seems eaten up mild digital pitted scarring then this is the appearance of the face with tight skin loss of wrinkles pointed and beak nose and radial furrowing like purse strings seen around the mouth the extent of skin sclerosis can be measured most commonly with modified rodman skin score called as mrss by this method the degree of skin sclerosis is scored from 0 to 3 by manual palpation at 17 different body sites giving a maximum score of 51 this method has been validated and shown to correlate with skin biopsy thickness overall disease severity and long term outcomes a number of other methods have been described to monitor the skin thickness that include the uh, durometry and more recently optical coherence tomography pruritus is described in 40% of the patient and may be intense in active disease and it correlates with extent of skin sclerosis mat like telangiectasis on the face and upper trunk and limbs and cutaneous calcinosis most often on the fingers and over the joints and pressure points develop later stages particularly in limited type of systemic sclerosis these are the mat like telangiectasia seen on the fa- on the face and telangiectasia is also seen on the tongue these are blanched by pressure gi manifestations are uh, there are a number of gastrointestinal manifestations and uh, which are predominantly as a consequence of reduced or abnormal motility of the gi tract it has been attributed to a combination of myopathic and neuropathic changes and these features include hypomotility dysphagia reflux esophagitis delay emptying paralytic ileus malabsorption pseudo obstruction overflow incontinence and constipation abnormalities in motility are seen on gi euro gi studies dynamic studies like barium meal and follow through and barium enema studies show multiple wide mouth diverticuli in the colon with broad base and neck but these di- uh, diverticuli are mainly asymptomatic then cardiopulmonary manifestations include interstitial lung disease pulmonary fibrosis pulmonary arterial hypertension cardiac myositis which lead to cardiomyopathy and cardiac arrhythmias the interstitial lung disease and pulmonary arterial hypertension are currently the most common cause of disease related deaths in systemic sclerosis symptoms are largely overlapping and comprise of dry cough um overlapping between heart and lungs and comprises of dry cough 
breathlessness, palpitation, syncope, and peripheral edema. The gold standard for diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension is right heart catheterization, showing a mean pulmonary pressure of at least 25 millimeter mercury at rest. Before catheterization, two-step process of combined assessment of percent predicted forced vital capacity or diffuse capacity for carbon monoxide, past or present telangiectasis, and uh, ACA positivity and terminal pro uh, um, pro brain um, natu retic peptide and urate levels and right axis deviation on ECG. So all these um, tests uh, can be done before doing the cardiac catheterization for assessment of pulmonary arterial hypertension. If the threshold level more than 300, an echocardiogram is indicated to measure the tricast valve regurgitation velocity and determine the need of cardiac catheterization to establish pulmonary arterial hypertension. Then this is the pulmonary fibrosis, which is the second a common cause of um, morbidity and mortality in um, systemic sclerosis, renal manifestation. The scleroderma renal crisis occurs in 5 to 10% of the patients within the first five years. RNA polymerase 3 antibodies are present in 59% of the patients and confer increased susceptibility to renal manifestation. Most patients have diffuse or rapidly progressive disease. Ugly aggressive treatment with angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors in patients with accelerated hypertension has improved the prognosis. So increased level of endothelin 1 and its receptor have been identified in SRC renal biopsies. So it is mandatory that in, uh, in diffuse and progressive disease, the kidney should be tested and early ACE inhibitors should be started. The cardiac, the kidney arteriogram show the fibrinoid necrosis of arterioles with glomerulosclerosis. You can compare the normal with abnormal. The musculoskeletal manifestations. The tendon friction rib over the finger flexors and extensors, wrist, elbow, knee, and ankle joint occur in 10% of the patient at presentation. Muscle weakness is a common symptom occurring in 90% of the cases. Two patterns of muscle involvement, a low-grade myopathy with mild weakness, and a less common inflammatory myositis occur in context with an overlap syndrome. Muscle involvement was associated with male sex, early diffuse disease, ATA or RNAP positivity, and interstitial lung disease, and is associated with reduced survival. So you can summarize the features of systemic sclerosis starting from the head, Tight skin over the face, small mouth, beak, nose, telangiectasias. Esophagus show dysmotility and stricture. Lung shows pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary fibrosis. Heart shows myocardial fibrosis, cardiomyopathy, arrhythmias. Kidney shows scleroderma renal crisis. Intestine shows malabsorption, hypermotility, and incontinence. Then Hands show the Raynaud's phenomena, if severe, can lead to digital ischemia and necrosis. And thickening of skin over the rest of the body occur in diffuse variety. But in limited variety, it is limited to face and hand. So if we take only the Crest syndrome, Crest syndrome includes, includes the number one is the calcinosis, which is the calcium deposited on deposits on the skin. Then Raynaud's phenomena, esophageal dysfunction, sclerodactyly, the tightening of the fingers, and telangiectasia, as we have already discussed. The Crest syndrome and its characteristic calcinosis cutis. You this radiograph show the calcification at the proximal, uh, at the distal interpharyngeal joint. The differential diagnosis of uh, systemic sclerosis are many, which include morphia, or, uh, which can be generalized morphia and pen, uh, sclerotic morphia, but there will be no Raynaud's phenomena and internal organ uh, involvement and sparing the hands and feet, which are the major differences. 
then eosinophilic fasciitis. Eosinophilic fasciitis is spare the face, start from the lower limb, spare the hand and feet, and there is a groove sign and persistent eosinophilia. Scleromix edema is characterized by leonine faces and waxy papules. Scleed edema is seen in children and diabetic skin is indurated, non-pitting with no clear demarcation. Acrosclerotic changes are seen in SLE and dermatomyositis. In nephrogenic systemic fibrosis involves extremities and rarely involves the face. Generalized ismix edema is characterized by abnormal thyroid function. Then there is a stiff skin syndrome an autosomal dominant disease present in infancy with rock hard skin, limited joint mobility and mild hypertrichosis, but um, no cases of systemic sclerosis occur at infancy. Classification of severity. The most important differentiation is between the limited or diffuse disease, which generally can be made early and easily, and certainly within the first 12 to 18 months of the disease. Once the classification has been made, patients retain their subgroup even if there is later improvement of the skin disease uh, in some diffuse cases. Another, another important subgrouping is based upon which of the specific autoantibodies are present. In general, case associated with diffuse disease or specific complications such as uh, pulmonary hypertension or lung fibrosis can be regarded as more severe. Important assessment of severity in all systemic sclerosis cases is early uh, systemic screening for internal organ disease. All patients should have these standard tests within the first 12 months of the diagnosis and every one to two year of follow-up. Skin scores are helpful in predicting the severity, which is modified Rodman skin score at baseline and uh, serially done Increased risk of major lung complication can be predicted by using a weighted score. There are specific tools for grading lung fibrosis based on spirometry and extent of disease on higher resolution CT scan. A composite detect tool to assess the risk of pulmonary hypertension in selected at-risk cases of systemic sclerosis. We have discussed this complication and comorbidities several times in this lecture before. Systemic sclerosis is a prototype multisystem disease and commonly affects many internal organs. Almost all patients are associated with GI manifestation, but these are not life-threatening. The lung complications like pulmonary fibrosis, fibrosis and pulmonary arterial hypertension are, and so as the cardiac heart failure, arrhythmias, and coronary atherosclerosis and then the scleroderma renal crisis. Digital vascular disease leads to ischemia and ulceration, and sometimes even to uh, necrosis and amputations. Inflammatory muscle involvement may lead to contractural changes in skin and tendon, myositis and arthritis. The comorbidities include thyroid and other organs such as primary biliary cirrhosis. The disease course and prognosis. Overall standard mortality ratio is 2.72 to 3.5. Overall life expectancy is 16 to 34 years, less than the age and sex matched population peers. High specific mortality, the case specific mortality is high, up to half of the cases diagnosed with systemic sclerosis, ultimately dying from the disease, which is a high percentage. Roughly one-third are due to pulmonary fibrosis and one for each to pulmonary hypertension and cardiac disease. Infection and malignancy account for two-thirds uh, two of non-systemic sclerosis-related deaths. There have been improvement in outcomes over the past two decades. There have been major improvements since 1980 in survival from uh, the renal disease which is associated with use of ACE inhibitors. Better treatment of pulmonary arterial hypertension and lung fibrosis has certainly improved the long-term survival. And result of improved survival is that the non-lethal burden 
of systemic sclerosis become more important and becoming more of a priority of systemic sclerosis care. Investigations. Investigation of systemic sclerosis is important in diagnosis and also in classification and clinical stratification. The most important generic tests are anti-nuclear antibody reactivity, nail fold caparoscopy, and investigations to exclude or confirm other autoimmune rheumatic diseases. Diagnosis of Raynaud's phenomena is based on history, but thermography is available can be extremely useful, confirmatory too. In addition, there should be routine assessment of biochemical and hematological laboratory tests and assessment of typical organ-based complications. But it should be emphasized that the final diagnosis of systemic sclerosis is mainly clinical. A skin biopsy is not needed unless there are atypical features or alternate diagnosis is considered. In particular, if deep form of morphia or fasciitis are in the differential diagnosis, then a full thickness uh, facial biopsy may be needed. Baseline assessment of uh, cardiac status by ECG and echocardiography and lungs by chest radiograph and lung function test is essential. Management. The management of systemic sclerosis is complex and depends upon the correct diagnosis and appropriate investigation. Some aspects of treatment are generic, especially the use of vasodilators for Raynaud's phenomena, proton pump inhibitors for GI reflux. So these uh, are the drugs which has to be included when we are managing a case of systemic sclerosis. Then the management of skin changes. UVA-1 phototherapy reduces the skin stiffness and thickness. UVA has better penetration than UVB. So this is the preferable mode of therapy. D-penicillin no, has no significant benefit in both low and high doses. So this drug is out. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors, imtinib, show limited effects in more and but more side effects. Low dose methotrexate, which was uh, used some time back, has not shown very significant improvement. Mycophenolate phenolate morphotil is slightly useful. Cyclophosphamide has shown benefit in pulmonary and also shown significant improvement in skin scores. Azathioprine has also shown uh, variable benefits when used alone or in combination with cyclophosphamide. For refractory or severe skin disease, parenteral cyclophosphamide may be considered given monthly infusion for six months before moving on to the maintenance. Data is emerging on use of autologous hemopoietic stem cell transplantation in some poor prognosis cases of diffuse systemic sclerosis. Biologics targeting T cell like sirolimus, uh, rituximab, or anti-interleukin-6 receptor monoclonal antibodies have shown some encouragement and a some improvement of skin scores is seen with photophoresis. Raynaud's phenomena in ischemia. The measure will be to avoid cold exposure by wearing layers of warm, loosely fitted clothing, quit smoking and vasodilator therapy that include calcium channel blockers, mainly nifedipine and prezosin or ACE, inhib ACE1 inhibitors. For finger and toe necrosis, intravenous prostaglandin, or finally, or amputation. GI complication for reflux, esophagitis, and dysphagia elevate the head of the bed. Frequent small meals. Avoid laying down within three to four hours of eating. Abstinence from caffeine-containing beverages and cigarette smoking and H2 blocker or proton pump inhibitor. For gastroparesis, pro-motility agents like metclopromide for malabsorption broad-spectrum antibiotics. For renal complication, SRC require early diagnosis and um, impact greatly on its outcome. ACE inhibitors supplemented by other antihypertensives remain the cornerstone of treatment of SRC. One year survival without captopril or ACE inhibitor is 15% and one year survival with captopril or ACE inhibitor is 76%. Pulmonary complications, both idiopathic and scleroderma associated pulmonary arterial hypertension are managed by prostacycline and prostacycline analogs, endothelin receptor blockers, and phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors, either singly or in combination. In patients with pulmonary fibrosis, 
fibrosis unresponsive to cyclophosphamide, tyrosine kin kinase inhibitor may remain an option in selected cases. Severe or progressive lung fibrosis are usually treated with intravenous cyclophosphamide for six months, although a trial of alternate approach with mycophenolate mofetil is underway and is showing good results. Tumor necrotic factor inhibitors like infliximab or tenacep may improve the inflammatory arthritis of systemic sclerosis and may also reduce the cardiopulmonary complications such as arterial hypertension. Erectile dysfunction is a common complication in male patients with uh, systemic sclerosis and uh, sildenafil is the frequently choice. Calcinosis is treated with warfarin, biphosphonate, uh, diltiazem, ammonium hydroxide, probenicid, intralegional corticosteroid, intravenous immunoglobulin, curatage, surgical excision, carbon dioxide laser, or extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy. Prognosis. With all the treatment, the diffuse systemic sclerosis has a 70% five-year and 50% 10-year survival, and limited has 90% five-year and 70% long-term survival, 10-year survival. Major causes of death, uh, again, the renal, cardiac, and pulmonary. And that's all for today. And I hope the subject is uh, clear after this lecture. And in case of any queries or questions, you can inbox me. Thank you very much. And hope to see you next time with uh, the topic of morphia. Goodbye and thank you.